I'm Claudia Yagoubi, Roshan Associate Professor and Coordinator of Persian Studies at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. It is my great pleasure to be here with you today with our roundtable titled Love, Laws and Changes. This roundtable wraps up a month long symposium. But don't worry, we are not going anywhere. We have more events coming up. On October 6th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, we have a panel on Black and Afro Iranians. And on October 15th, we have another plan uh, event panel on Persian language instruction. So make sure you're not missing this. Before I introduce our panelists, I, I would like to thank um, our co-sponsors co for the symposium. The American Institute of Iranian Studies, UNC Persian Studies Program, the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, Duke UNC Consortium for the Middle East Studies, the Center for the Study of uh, Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences, Associate Dean of Global Affairs, the Department of English and Comparative Literature, History, Religious Studies, Women and Gender Studies, and Geography, the Institute of Arts and Humanities, Iranian Cultural Society of North Carolina, the Library Collections Horner Jarrahi Speaker Series, and the Countering Hate Initiative. I would also like to thank the Army of Women who have been working with me in planning and organizing this symposium since 2018. I appreciate and value Emma Harver, Angelica Strauss, Lori Harris, and Ash Barnes for their efforts and work. They've brought so much positive energy and diverse perspectives to the table for these events. Now onto the panel of today. I would like to ask you to use the Q&A button on your screen to post your questions for the panelists. Please do not use the chat button, just use the Q&A. When you ask a question, please indicate which panelist it is directed to. And I will ask as many of your questions as possible from our panelists today. Our first speaker is Dr. Mehrangis Kar, who is a prominent writer, attorney, and activist specializing in women's rights and family law. Currently the Senior Technical Advisor for Rule of Law at Siamak Burzand Foundation. She was formerly a visiting scholar at Harvard University, Brown University, University of Cape Town, Wesley College, California State University at Northridge, and Brookings Institution. Having practiced law in the Islamic Republic of Iran for 20 years, she has published numerous books and articles on issues related to law, gender equality, and democracy in Iran and abroad. Dr. Carr has received several international awards for her human rights endeavors, including the Democracy Award for national, um, from the National Endowment for Democracy. A few of her books include Women's Participation in Politics, Obstacles and Possib Possibilities, published in 20, 2001, Violence Against Women in Iran, published in 2000, and her book Violence Against Women in Iran has turned into an essential re uh, reading and reference for research on women um, against violence, violence against women in Iran. Dr. Carr's paper or speech is titled Laws Against Love and Loving in Iran Today. Dr. Carr, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. I am so happy to participate in, in this wonderful symposium and thank you, Janet and Claudia and others for preparing this uh, symposium online. I'm talking about law and love in Islamic Republic of Iran. 
love story is very, very sweet in literature, but when uh, we are reading love story on uh, Iranian uh, legal system, it is not sweet. So uh, forgive me if I say something that I, uh, I'm sure that uh, you don't like uh, to listen such a thing. As you know, in 1979, we had Islamic revolution in Iran. And the time I got my license to practice law in Iran. So you can understand that it was not good time for such a thing, a female, a secular female who should go to the courts with mandatory hijab and should go to the courts and defend uh, according Islamic law. It was not easy to me, but anyway, I have written about that on some of my uh, books and now I don't want to talk about that. Just, I want to give you very brief and short knowledge about the legal system on love and the law, uh, particularly uh, on women, not men. When I started my practice, the laws against love and loving were already passed by the Islamic Republic's parliament. And uh, these laws, which have their basis in Islamic Sharia law, target women more than men. This is something that is very important in uh, Sharia law uh, that now uh, completely moved to our legal system. Once full sexual relation and intercourse take place, the offense is called zina or, uh, or adultery, punishable by 100 lashes. If the woman in love is married and sleeps with a man other than her husband, it is punishable by death, by stoning, uh, and most women at the risk of stoning whom I came across in my profession were not against mandatory hijab. This was very important uh, to me because I could not understand such a thing. They wore hijab for personal faith and, and belief. They belonged to underprivileged classes of the society and had no money to hire a lawyer. And sometimes I was not get money from them. And that's why I could recognize such a thing in uh, our society. So they belong to underprivileged classes of the society and had no money to hire a lawyer. When appearing before the judge in the Islamic court, they would tremble with fear, yet they used to defend love and their lovers. That was great. One would explain how she was forced into a marriage when she was a mere child before running away. It was something that I heard about that uh, from uh, most of them. Sometimes women were sentenced to lashing without committing any romantic act with another man, but simply for spending time with men while not observing their hijab or for the sin of laughing out loud and enjoying men's company in a non-sexual context. This was something that all of us uh, were at risk in inside Iran, but it doesn't mean that they can 
uh, uh, or they could arrest uh, any uh, women who had this lifestyle. But sometimes they were uh, they were attacking to a party, and they were arrest arresting. Sometimes I was arrested in party. Sometimes uh, my friends arrested in this party, and after that. Uh, they were saying that uh, you did fi'le haram. Uh, it means that you were uh, you were sitting with uh, men without hijab and you were drinking and you were dancing or something like that. But there was not any sexual activities. In these cases, women wiped their lipstick and removed their eye makeup before facing the judge but the judge was able to see the traces of the red lipstick lipstick uh, or the eyeliners women would be flogged or forced to pay a fine and return home smooth and heal their wounds and resume their desired lifestyles. Never they stopped their lifestyles. They ignored the commitment to moral codes they had made before the judges because everybody who was arrested in party or such a thing, uh, they should uh, sign and, uh, and uh, say that I never do that such a thing in future but women in iran they don't care about this kind of uh, commitments religious and traditional women made up most of my clients in the cases of romantic offenses when faced with these charges i found them more and in love than modern Iranian women. They had no idea about feminist theories. They did not know about the women rights activists and their activities. They only knew that it was not the court's business, the state business, that they had fallen in love. More than any equal rights theory or activism, such pure and bare understanding of the right to love astonished and uh, and angered the judges who were ignorant of the changing times and he was insisting about a period of time that is past probably more than a thousand years ago anyway let's take Let's take a very closer look at the laws which govern love and romance in Iran. When I uh, give you some summary of that, it doesn't mean that uh, it is all kind of discrimination or violation of women's rights and probably men rights but just just uh, i mentioned uh, some examples but not all uh, of uh, uh, love the first loving and lashing i uh, mentioned that a little but now i give you the article article 637 when a man and a woman who are not married to each other uh, commit indecent acts other than zina, uh, adultery, such as kissing or sleeping next to one another, they shall be sentenced to up to 99 lashes. And uh, the second social interactions between men and women, Article 6. 38 of Ta'zirat. Anyone who in public places and roads openly commits a haram, 
sinful act in addition to the punishment provided for the act shall be sentenced to two months imprisonment or up to 74 lashes. A third is uh, uh, zina in Islamic jurisprudence is full sexual relations and in uh, intercourse between a man and a woman who are not legally and religiously married. The punishment for both men and women is 100 lashes if they are both unmarried. And the fourth in loving and stoning that uh, I mentioned that in cases when the woman or man is married and has access to his or her spouse for sexual pleasure, having sexual relations with another man or woman in considered uh, instance of ihsan and is punishable by stoning or execution. This is a very, very hard punishment that Iranian women uh, are facing that sometimes they did do that more than 80 times, I think. Unmarried sex between a non-Muslim man and a Muslim woman. Article 224 of Islamic Penal Code states the cases uh, where illicit sexual relations is punishable by death. Section B of that article reads sexual relations between unmarried man and woman where the man is not Muslim but the woman is Muslim is punishable by death for the non-Muslim man. This one is very important in our legal system because the man is punishable by death. This section is not only an example of how hideous death penalty is, but it also criminalized the conduct of two, two, uh, uh, two uh, sane and two mature persons who have willingly engaged in sexual relations and declares, declares the man deserving of death for being non-Muslim. One of the philosophical justification for any punishment is that the act committed has resulted in harm to other human being or beings. The so-called offense this section refers to involves a single Muslim woman and non-Muslim man having had sexual relations. Who has been harmed by their action? Why one deserves death and the other has to be lashed hundred times and left in grief over the perished lover? There is no opportunity to pose such questions and challenge such laws which have been ruling out country for decades. If the question is ever raised, the inquirer is condemned to prison and silence. And now uh, all Iranian uh, women's rights and human rights uh, who they uh, were writing and talking critical about this kind of uh, legal system against uh, uh, women and sometimes men. Uh, uh, now they are in jail, now they are in uh, um, uh, exile, now they are, uh, most of them, they are silent uh, under uh, huge bail at home. So there is not any chance for criticize this legal system because they accused anybody who do that, somebody 
who is working against Islam, not who is working against the law and discriminatory law. This, this was very important, and now this is very important obstacle uh, for women's rights activists, um, because when they say our legal system is similar with Sharia, it means that if you criticize that, they accuse you as somebody who is working against Sharia. And the punishment for, uh, uh, for this person uh, is very heavy and sometimes, uh, and sometimes a death penalty. Women and same-sex love, as you know, that is now very important all over the world and uh, uh, in Sharia law, it is not uh, accepted. Article 238 of Islamic Penal Code states that musahiqe, musahiqe is defined as where a female person puts her sex organ on the sex organ of another person of the same sex. Uh, Article 239 of the uh, Islamic Penal Code uh, states uh, the hat punishment for musahiqe shall be 100 lashes. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, now uh, is very harsh and nobody can talk about that in Iran, in the press, or uh, they cannot, you know, have any organization about that. And so there is silence on such a thing. The other one is uh, murder, murder of wife or honor killing. Section E of Article 302 of the Islamic Penal Code states that if a man finds his wife during sex with another man, he has the right to kill both without being subject to any punishment. There is no reference to such, ex uh, such exception or uh, some, kind, some kind of punishment uh, in the Iranian law for a woman who finds her husband under the same circumstances. In this article of law, we are facing a very important type of human rights violation. It is that there are no considerations for the woman who will find another woman in bed with her husband. The law is silent on this matter. When the law is silent in, in some matter, it means that somebody can abuse that uh, against somebody else, like this one. Because, because when it is silent, it means that if a woman, uh, a woman, you know, uh, does such a thing against the, her husband, it would be uh, punishable uh, to the sauce. Women's romantic rights violation in marriage. So in marriage, we can see and we can find some kind of romantic rights violation. Sometimes it, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is showing uh, as polygamy. The fact that polygamy is allowed for men in Iran leads to fear, insecurity, anxiety, and restlessness for women in a marriage where the wife loves her husband, or in a marriage that that uh, wife likes stability of family, or uh, the wife, uh, uh, the wife needs uh, uh, financial, and uh, she is not working, and she cannot uh, uh, make money 
for them they they are all the time uh, in worriness and uh, they cannot be comfortable and uh, uh, they they have an anxiety and a restlessness and in a marriage where the wife loves her husband should come suffer from emotional imbalance and distress all the time because any time it could be happen and she doesn't know what time probably or not limitation of women in marriage for sex article 1059 of the civil code prohibits the marriage between a muslim woman with a non-muslim man how could one justify this prohibition by logical logical reasoning if a muslim woman falls in love with a non-muslim man how is it the state's business to ban such mutual love and the other one in laws insistence on women obedience article 1108 of the iranian civil code states that if the wife refused uh, if the wife refused to fulfill duties of a wife without legitimate excuse she will not be entitled to the coast financial support in islamic jurisprudence the most important duty of a woman in a martial relationship is meeting her husband's sexual demands even if she does not desire it when approached by her husband this way the law has ignored the women's sexual desire and has only accorded important to men's sexual in all of legal system it is true and that's important very important the desire of men for having uh, sexual uh, sexual enjoy and in divorce we can understand some discrimination and imbalance between men and women section 1133 of iranian civil code states that a man could request the court to divorce his wife under the conditions stipulated in this code note the woman could also file for divorce in the court if the conditions under section 1119 1129 and 1130 of this code are met so you can understand that how much women are limited when they want a divorce and sometimes uh, sometimes a few years when i had been in iran uh, a few years uh, my client who was a woman uh, didn't know what can she do because she didn't like her husband and she was married on the paper on the formal paper but she couldn't have you know enjoy of sex and love because uh, it was very dangerous for her but her husband could go to the court and uh, claim that uh, because uh, his wife uh, doesn't live with uh, him that's that's necessary uh, the court give him license for having another wife so polygamy works against against women in all cases like this like divorce when uh, when woman is looking for divorce article 1170 uh, if the mother becomes 
insane or marries another man during the period which she has custody, the right to custody devolves to the father. That is another, another kind of violation against women's right. It means that uh, when a woman, you know, when a woman divorced in any, any kind, any reason, uh, it's better if she doesn't have any sexual relationship or any marriage because by that they can you know they they, they can uh, get the children child and give to uh, her or his father and there is um, no matter in what age is children or child in summary we can say that iranian women are deprived of any human romantic rights as long as this political legal regime is in power. Before that, we had penal code, but it was not Islamic penal code. And that's why it was much better. And there was not something like stoning, like lashing, and uh, like something, uh, something of violation against women's rights that now we are facing with that uh, for more than 40 years after Islamic revolution. In order for the Iranian woman to lead a natural life and address her natural and intimate needs, she has to engage in romance in hiding because it is not possible uh, women say that okay we ignore sex we ignore love story and we ignore enjoy uh, of being with uh, with a man so they do probably sometimes uh, everything in hiding such approach is not a natural and is not a healthy a healthy uh, situation on women and on society. That's why all human rights activists and women's rights activists now, they say that the society needs separation between religion and government. And without getting that, the legal system should be the same that now we are talking about that and uh, in general uh, if uh, the government uh, uh, mixed with religion not just islam any religion probably we can not talk about uh, about equality because all religion as as i know they don't accept and respect equality between men and women. Now, we wish to get chance for having another political system uh, that they, they can accept equality, gender equality, but I am not sure that it is easy and uh, it is uh, accessible right now. Now we are working for that. But we hope that we can get it by a very peaceful transition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Carr. Um, our second speaker is Professor Janet Afari, um, who you know already because she was our um, keynote speaker. She holds the Melicham Chair in Global Religion and Modernity at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where she is also a professor of religious studies. Her books include Sexual Politics in Modern Iran, published by Cambridge University Press in 2009, and was the winner of the British Society for Middle East Studies Annual Book Prize. 
Dr. Alfari's uh, paper or speech today is titled Iranian Romance in the Digital Age from Arranged Marriages to White Marriages. Um, Dr. Alfari. Thank you, Claudio, for that introduction. Thank you, Emma, for your help. I'm very glad to be following uh, Dr. Carr. Everyone, we all know about her dedication, her activism on behalf of women's rights and as a human rights lawyer. Um, and I'm glad that she explained uh, what the current laws of Iran have, are and have been for the last several decades, because that actually means that I don't have to do that. So there are at least three ways we can look at the question of romance and marriage in Iran, that is heterosexual marriage in Iran. Um, one is from the legal perspective, that is what, is the, what are the laws. One is the cultural attitudes, that is what do people in general, people generally people in society think about such relationships at the present time. And the third one is uh, what is the behavior of young people? What is it that they're actually doing in society? And so to understand the latter two, uh, primarily the behavior, but also the cultural, we held a conference at UCSB <clears throat> a few years ago, and then we followed that up with invitation to scholars in the field um, to be able to analyze the evolution of romance and marriage in Iran in the last 40 years. Um, and uh, the results are coming out actually in February. And I just wanted to mention some of the people who work with us because <clears throat> I, what I'm presenting today is really the result of a group project. We had political scientist Behruz Ali Khani, medical anthropologist Soraya Tremyon and Azale Ahmadi, sociologist Maserat Amir Ebrahimi and Ashraf Zahidi, anthropologist Erica Friedel and Mary Hegland, Media and communication studies people, um, Vahid Golzard and Christina Miguel, education specialist, Amir Mir Fakhroi, historians, Olam Bezovat Handust, Mariam Sheipari, and myself. And people were from a variety of locations. We had scholars from the United States, from Iran, from UK, from Canada, and from Germany contributing to this study. So what we see in our study is that Iran has gone through a dramatic change in the institution of marriage and romance um, in the last four decades. Um, there has been a unique demographic change. Population growth has dropped dramatically from something like 4.0 to 1.15. There's also been a great drop in fertility rates from 6.4 to about 1.9. <clears throat> to 2.0, depending on the period. Uh, and as a result of these, there has been a substantial increase in the age at first marriage for both women and men. And the number of formal marriages has declined markedly, partly because of the draconian laws that Mehrangiz Akar talked about, that is an unwillingness to, for, on the part of women particularly, to get themselves entangled while rates of temporary marriage and then gradually cohabitation have increased. What we see in Iran, as dramatic as the laws of Iran and the culture of Iran is, as for example, the United States and Europe, is actually not so different from what happened in US and Europe also. Because what happened in <clears throat> the West is that as a result of industrialization, urbanization, vaccination, better hygiene, and particularly the adoption of contraceptive technology, which then became widely available in the early 1960s, the institution of marriage went through a profound change in Europe and the United States. People began to live longer, uh, fertility rates dropped, marriage became more than just an institution for procreation, women's demand for emotional and sexual intimacy increased. Also attitudes about premarital sex started to change and sex outside marriage became more acceptable. The widespread use of contraceptives made marriage a more companionate marriage. Um, birth control opened the doors to non-productive, non-reproductive forms of relations. In other words, people living together, childless marriages. 
to casual encounters, to non-heterosexual relationships. And as women became more sexually assertive in the West, they also became less tolerant of men's extramarital affairs, both heterosexual and homosexual. And we all see a gradual breaking down of old social hierarchies. These are racial, ethnic divisions, religious divisions. In other words, now we have more intermarriages <clears throat> across ethnicities, across racial lines. And I would say that this is what we're also witnessing in Iran. Um, the birth rate has dropped, mass vaccination and better hygiene um, has taken root, life expectancy has increased. And particularly, gender, new gender norms has saturated society through the international media. And as a result of that, expectations of women have changed in marriage, uh, moving far beyond changes that had initially started in the Pahlavi era, uh, when attempts to, for a more companionate marriage were introduced, as Mehrang Gizikor talked about. Now, <clears throat> this is really quite astonishing, the fact that romance and marriage have been changing despite all the attempts of the Islamic State to reverse the clock. Um, part of it is the regime to blame itself. Once it started recruiting young rural uh, men and women into its mil militia, gave them economic and social benefits such as a salary um, and, and higher education, they also wanted to enter into more companionate marriages. So the cultural divide of Iranian society, which Nikki Kedi had talked about in her book in the, about the 1970s, has gradually diminished. Um, we also see in tribal and rural communities, strictly arranged marriages have, are no longer the norm. Uh, we see that marriage is no longer as much an institution for procreation. Uh, and we see that the mean age for marriage for girl has gone up and dating has become a more acceptable part of society. One ramification of this is uh, a new kind of relationship which is referred to as white marriage. White marriage is essentially cohabitation. And my colleague Maserat Amir Ibrahimi looks at this phenomenon. You have a situation where large numbers of women are entering higher education. Women are particularly eager to get into universities because so many venues are close to them and education is really the one venue in which they hope to have some uh, control over their lives. And as they come to the university, and many times they move from their small towns to big cities to go to the university, they start living in the dormitories and then gradually they move into communal homes and then eventually they move into small apartments and the government and um, businesses started building very tiny apartments, uh, studios essentially, which made it possible now for these young women who didn't want to go back to their um, community of origin because the community of origin was very conservative and now they had a boyfriend and they liked the more open lifestyle of the cities. And so you start to have uh, members of what's known as third generation. So the first generation being the generation that participated in the revolution. The second generation, people who are very young children at the time of the revolution. And um, they were disproportionately affected by the results of the laws uh, that were in place. And the third revolution are people who were born after the revolution. Um, and they're, they're really quite active. Uh, they've become social actors in their own lives and in society. They're much more educated than their mothers and grandmothers. They're more active. They're more aware of their rights. Um, they postpone marriage. They live alone. They live out, along, outside the conventional norms. Um, and the building of multi-complex units uh, has made that possible. So it's more of a policy of don't ask, don't tell. A young woman gets an apartment, sometimes two do, and her boyfriend might come in and out, or she may even, in, in a sense, be living with her boyfriend, but they make sure they don't leave the place together and don't enter and out, exit the building together. Uh, <clears throat> so, Ghulam uh, Rezov Atandust and Mariam Sheypari look at white marriage, which is becoming very popular. What is astonishing is that you do have the option of something called temporary marriage in uh, Iranian society. And yet people refuse to do that because of, well, all the stigma that is attached to uh, temporary marriage in Iranian society. So they enter these illegal cohabitations. 
essentially um, challenging the these draconian laws of Iranian society. And the government's attitude was initially to try to crack down, and then they realized they can't do that. And finally, they got to the point where they've just ignored it, probably because of the prevalence of the practice. Another way in which institutional marriage and relationships have changed are technology and social media. So Vahid Gulzard and her colleague have shown that the internet has opened up new opportunities. So in this very sex segregated society of Iran, a virtual space has opened the space essentially where you can mingle, where you can mingle people of opposite sex, can mingle, can interact, can be very intimate uh, emotionally, um, psychologically um, with one another. Uh, and it provides a way to combat loneliness, to create meaningful relationships with like-minded people who then take it a step further and gradually start meeting in coffee shops and in other locations. But of course, one has to be careful. Um, at the same time, the internet has of course opened up a lot of risk with which we are quite familiar. The question of online sexual harassment and cyber crime with which women are also dealing um, throughout the world. Another technology which has made it possible for women to maintain intimate relationships is hymenoplasty. This is a controversial surgery when, when a woman undergoes a surgery that repairs her hymen shortly before her marriage. So her husband would think that he's marrying a virgin. Now hymenoplasty actually goes back a long time. I was able to document it in the 19th century, uh, very capable midwives who apparently knew how to do that. But hymenoplasty was, was performed primarily in cases of, let's say, incest or rape, or in the middle of the 20th century in relationships where the woman was hoping that it would end in marriage and then she was essentially duped. Today it's different. Um, young women are entering sexual relationships with their boyfriends willingly, knowing well that this may not end up in a marriage. And uh, Azal Ahmadi has argued that hymenoplasty is essentially a covert form of resistance against a society that restricts women to the social sphere of premarital chastity. By manipulating, she says, the medicalization of virginity, women covertly resist the dichotomous gendered classification that constrain them. Um, uh, rules and regulations and norms that say that women must remain a virgin until a marriage and otherwise any kind of sexual relationship, premarital relationship is considered deviant. Another way in which technology has altered the institution of marriage is assisted reproductive technologies. Mm. When it was introduced, the state actually embraced it. There was some discussion about what types of it was available. Of course, if a man was in, uh, let's say a man was infertile and he wanted to have uh, ART and have uh, essentially a child from another woman, there was really no legal impediment to that because Shizm allows for a polygamy. So in a sense, it was a kind of virtual polygamy. Um, it was another way, uh, the, the question was whether if the, uh, um, the woman actually was infertile, uh, the, the man was infertile and the woman had to have another male partner to be able to have a child, which would have been then considered essentially a, a major transgression according to Islamic law. But gradually they also accepted that, um, that a woman could do that under medical conditions. That is of course an ART and not an actual sexual intercourse. But what ART did was that it brought couples closer to each other. So Previously, let's say if a man was infertile, he would divorce his wife. Even if he was infertile, he would get a second or a third wife and eventually, or he would have polygamous relationships. And eventually by some miracle or um, cleverness of one of his wives, he would end up with a child. Um, and now there's really no reason for that ruse. A couple cannot closely and intimately decide how to solve this problem. They will go to a clinic. The in-laws don't have to really be involved. Uh, but one issue that has appeared and Soraya Tremion talks about is that there's a real need or interest in community to have a child that's related to you. So even though you're doing ART, um, you want to have a child that's somehow biologically related to you. And so here people are uh, asking, you know, for contributions 
um, from, for sperm or egg from relatives. Um, sometimes it's, again, a don't ask, don't tell, where the wife doesn't really know who is actually contributing. Maybe the husband wouldn't tell her. It will be a secret between her and between the husband and the doctor. Sometimes she knows. Um, so these are some of the issues that we need to know more about, to, to what extent the woman is actually aware of this um, and the fact that who is actually being, for example, contributing a sperm in this case. There are also dramatic changes happening in rural and tribal sectors of society. So Erica Friedel and uh, Mary Hegland uh, have done almost uh, over 40 years of work in villages in southwest Iran. Um, and also areas near Shiraz. And what they show is that young people are becoming far more active in choosing their spouses, that young women have high expectations from marriage. Uh, as a result of the fact that girls are becoming more educated in Iran, uh, a higher percentage of girls are actually going to the university. Men are deciding that university isn't gonna make you much money, you better go into business. So uh, there's a discrepancy now in terms of marriage compatibility. Women, these highly more, more educated women, are not really finding a spouse in their community that will be compatible to them. So they either don't marry or they marry eventually somebody that is not so compatible, in which marriage is not a very happy one. It may lead to divorce. Um, and, you know, so that's, that is one level of problems we're seeing now within the rural community. Some of these rural communities are really not so much rural anymore. They become suburbs now as um, they've grown, as cities have grown and are starting to claim rural populations as suburbs. Um, the other problem is that expectations about marriage remain the same. In other words, uh, people expect, the couple expect their parents uh, to pay for all the wedding expenses. Um, and the parents are willing to do that, except the parents don't have the means to do that. And the expectations have gone really high up Friedel and Hergland show because of the internet. So there's the expectation of a fancy wedding and the clothing and lots and lots of guests and a really fancy um, meal, maybe even in a hotel, um, something that's just beyond the ability. And so people are borrowing extensively the parents which is of course means that they have no money by the time they themselves are retiring. So uh, this kind of discrepancy with young people wanting to get full economic support from their families, but also then wanting to live independent lives. And you know, for the elderly to live independent lives, you need to have friendships, friendships that you've developed during your younger years. You need to have hobbies. You need to have a pension to travel, perhaps senior citizen centers, and these don't exist, and so or very little. And so what it means is that the elderly now is becoming very lonely because they had expected that in their old age, uh, they would be around their, you know, living as their mother-in-law did, for example, with them, living with their uh, daughter-in-law or uh, and having their grandchildren around, and that is not happening again. And finally, we even see changes at the tribal level, um, and Behruz Ali Khani looks at the Bakhtiyari tribe, and I don't know how many people know uh, the Bakhtiyaris uh, living in Western Khuzestan, Loristan, Bushir, Esfahan, have almost a caste-like system within them, in which you have the more established uh, Bakhtiyari members of the tribe versus the marginal members of the tribe. And the two never intermarried, unless it was a situation where a man from a more established Bakhtiyari um, community had, a, you know, his wife had died, he had several children, he desperately needed a, a woman to take care of his children, in which case he would go to a woman from the more marginalized tribe and marry her. Otherwise, it was more or less a taboo. And what uh, Ali Khani shows is that uh, after the revolution, members of these lower, uh, if you will, caste kind of parts of the tribe, they start moving up. They enter the, into the Islamic Republic's uh, apparatus. Uh, they become, for example, members of the Pastoran and other agencies. So that means they get an income. Um, their children start to get an education. They have a pension and all these um, attributes that come with being a member of uh, the state. And so their status of living actually goes up compared to the more established members of the established tribes who basically remain dormant or their status go down. 
And so now you have a situation where, yes, a member of an established tribe kind of reluctantly says, well, uh, yes, you know, my son or my daughter can marry someone from these more marginalized tribes, but only if they're a medical doctor or professor. So education um, is breaking down gradually these uh, hierarchies. And so all of this is happening in society when textbooks, uh, as Mir Fakhroi shows in uh, our study, remain extremely rigid. I mean, you have the old fashioned look of the husband and wife and the mother is a dependent wife staying at home, uh, taking care of the children with no occupation, uh, two kids and so forth. And although they're all religious texts around the house, so that's the textbook that children have. No attention to you know, various ethnicities. In the, case, the texts he shows are extremely racist um, as well as sexist and heteronormative. Um, and of course, the laws, which uh, you heard about in the previous presentation. So what we see is that Iran has become a land of deep contradictions. And that's just not just in politics, but also in love, sex, and marriage. Uh, many women earn a living and financially support their families. In fact, um, our survey has shown that uh, um, almost 44% of married women are, um, are employed and bringing uh, money basically to the family. A significant number of urban women have also chosen to stay single or if divorced and widowed, never to remarry. And yet textbooks remain deeply conservative, portraying women as primarily dependent wives and mothers. We have a situation when young people are dating online and many urban women in, are engaging in premarital sex with their boyfriend, but when the relationship does not end in marriage, the women undergo hymenoplasty before getting married to a more available and conventional male partner. We have anachronistic laws that declare intimacies between unrelated men and women unlawful, and from time to time severely punish people for breaching the law, imprisonment, or lashing. And at the same time, you have a situation where couples are brazenly electing to cohabit in white marriages rather than enter into a formal or temporary marriage. You have a situation where families place a high value on formal marriage and having children. They go to assisted reproductive clinics to receive the latest Western technology in order to conceive. And yet the desire to have a child to whom one is related by blood is so strong that occasionally husbands and doctors secretly collude to impregnate a wife with the semen of a close male relative. In many ways, the political and economic ties that used to uphold the old social hierarchies of tribes have broken down, yet members of high status tribes, even if relegated to a modest income and standard of living, continue to look down on tribal, marginal tribes of their own community who have moved up the economic hierarchy and often refuse or do so with great reluctance to consider their members as suitable marriage partners. In rural and tribal communities, you see families have become much smaller uh, with both men and women marrying much later. And yet couples tend to demand all the old economic perks of traditional marriages, which simply are beyond the reach of most families today. They opt for extravagant weddings, a fully furnished home, and all the accompanying luxuries. They also expect their parents to pay for everything and the parents themselves willingly take on these ruinous expenses that then leave them impoverished in old age. But at the same time, the newlyweds want to live independent lives away from the extended family, which includes little obligation for the care of their parents in their old age. It is unclear how these dramatic contradictions can be resolved in Iranian society. So we concluded that Iranian society seems to be reaching a breaking point not just politically with periodic state, um, street protests and demonstrations, which have become a part of life, but also socially and culturally in terms of attitudes towards love, sex, and marriage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Afari. Um, just quickly, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Afari, the, um, this research is available right now at, in the form of a collected um, volume. Um, yes, it's called Iranian Romance in the Digital Age and it's appearing with Bloomsbury Press in February of 2021. Thanks for asking. 
Thank you. And it's um, available for pre-order, everyone. Yes, it's on Amazon. Thank you. So our next speaker is Professor Nayere Tohidi, who's a professor and former chair of the Gender and Women's Studies Department and currently the funding director of the Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at California State University at Northridge. She is also a research associate at the Program for Iranian Studies and the Center for Near Eastern Studies of UCLA, where she has been coordinating the bilingual lecture series on Iran since 2003. She is the recipient of several grants, fellowships, and research awards, including a year of Fulbright lectureship and a research at the Academy of Sciences of Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Some of her publications include Globalization, Gender and Religion, The Politics of Women's Rights in Catholic and Muslim Contexts, Women in Muslim Societies, Diversity Within Unity and Feminism, Democracy and Islamism in Iran. Dr. Tohidi has also served as a consultant to the United Nations on project, projects concerning gender and development and women and civil society building in the Middle East and post-Soviet Euro-Asia. Dr. Tohidi will talk about the trajectory of changes and continuity in the past 40 years in attitudes, norms, and discourses towards love, marriage, sexuality, and body politics for us today. Dr. Tonidi. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. <clears throat> Let me also thank uh, Emma Harver uh, and you, Dr. Claudia Yakubian, <clears throat> and all the sponsors and organizers of this wonderful symposium. Um, and also the participants. I have listened to most of the papers and enjoyed and learned from them. Um, I also, before starting my talk, want to just remind us all about Nasrin Sotude and all political prisoners, all the human rights and women's rights activists who are struggling uh, under this pandemic in various corners of uh, numbers of prisons in different parts of Iran. And we know that recently, <clears throat> Nasrin Sotudeh, who is a defense lawyer of the uh, human rights activists and many uh, minority groups in Iran and uh, women, children, uh, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, uh, sexual minorities, uh, those who are fighting for against compulsory hijab and so forth. Um, so she was, she took, uh, resorted actually uh, out of desperation to hunger strike for 46 days, demanding that uh, like other prisoners that the government released during the pandemic, political prisoners too, all of them should be released at least temporarily to avoid the danger of infection. But so far, unfortunately, uh, there has been no changes in the policy of the government, but Nasrin was successful to draw international attention to the plight of prisoners in Iran, which uh, she's like, some people have said that Iran's Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who has been trying to change the law in favor of equality and is paying heavy price for that. Um, okay, now back to my talk. Uh, what I want to offer here is an overview of, uh, of what I was able to listen uh, from other uh, scholars and got registered in my mind. Uh, but my overview will be from a sociological perspective. Uh, fortunately, my colleague and friend Janet Afari, uh, in her 
talk just now uh, summarized a lot of what I wanted to say in terms of um, changes, especially um, changes in marriage patterns and also in some demograph important demographic changes. Let me start with a with an epistemological uh, observation in general about the trajectory of changes in Iran um, body culture, if you will. Uh, I have uh, borrowed this uh, notion of uh, somatocentrism versus somatophobia uh, in uh, uh, toward body and body image and uh, as a cultural uh, so th this the terms and the uh, the way that it it is applied to feminist analysis of uh, <clears throat> women's attitudes toward their body, their sexuality, or generally society's attitude. I have borrowed from the uh, African-American feminist scholar and activist Barbara Smith and her work on black feminism and somatosensory uh, that brought my attention uh, to this under a spectrum of somatosensory uh, in Iran. I, uh, I observed that in Iran we started, and I mentioned this even before uh, reading uh, uh, Barbara Smith, she actually helped me to articulate that theoretically better, but I observed how in my article in uh, Jense in Nime uh, Digar, the other half, uh, 20 some years ago, uh, that how we, just prior to the Islamic revolution, there was a kind of a somatophobia, uh, rather prevalent among activists, among women who were socially um, and politically engaged in society, and among men too. By somatophobia, uh, I mean um, a kind of uh, fear and loathing of the body. It refers to a belief system often not consciously held or consciously examined that teaches the body is something to be loathed or distrusted, often in contrast to the mind spirit or immortal soul. Uh, of course, this was formulated in the context of uh, Western um, manifestations of this concept, but it has appeared in other parts of the world in various religions. While on the other hand, the other extreme, rather polar uh, extreme of this um, uh, somatophobia is uh, somatocentrism, especially these have these two uh, poles of this spectrum of uh, somatosensory have important uh, implications for gender, masculinity, femininity, uh, even with implications uh, for racism and colorism. Because body image is a subjective picture of one's own physical appearance, established both by self-awareness and by noting the reactions of others. Preoccupation with body image and the physical appearance of one's body denotes how much value one ascribes to their phenotypical traits. Body image may be valued highly, and more often than not, this uh, dissatisfaction with one's own body image that perverts the value with other social effects. This applies to men, women, queers, and sexual minorities in general. 
For example, in Iran, obsession with the nose and so many, so much, uh, very high rates of nose job and uh, nose sen uh, surgery, which is among the highest in the world, uh, maybe is relevant to the changes in body image that uh, has happened, especially after the revolution. Uh, so, in contrast to somatophobia, somatocentrism actually celebrates body, emphasizes body, and uh, uh, it's a cultural value system in which biological determinism is the basis for social organization. The phenotypical variation of an individual in the system determines the individual's social identity and social relations not necessarily social position. So what I have observed, and I'm, I uh, try to give some examples, is that in Iran, uh, during the years prior to the Islamic Revolution, a trend of ascetic mentality was, as I said, widespread among both religious and some secular activists and intellectuals who were sympathetic to the underground guerrilla movements training self-deprivation, avoiding indulgement of bodily pleasures, including uh, even drinking wine, even among secular activists, training one's body to live like a hard-working poor workers, resist the hardship of prison and torture, because that was always a possibility to happen, especially for those who read a lot and read the underground books, and also activists to the gorillas. So especially women were supposed to try to appear as asexual as much as possible, not wearing new and sharp clothing, not wearing cosmetics. I remember girls were not supposed, especially girls, younger girls, were not supposed to laugh out loud. And this was, again, not just among the traditional religious segments of society, but in general, even in universities uh, among my own uh, generations. And then, of course, after the revolution, the whole notion of melate guerrier, uh, the cry nation <laughs> or crying nation that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini emphasized was a value uh, that a virtue uh, rather than a problem. Um, but the, uh, the present changes that we have uh, been discussing shows that we are actually moving, we have moved away in the past, uh, especially three decades after the war, because during the war still this ascetic and, um, you know, like withdrawing from your body and spirituality, emphasis on the mind and uh, and uh, so forth uh, was uh, widespread. But after the war and in the beginning of the, what they called con the, pro the stage of construction or reconstruction, Bosozi, Sozandegi, etc., the attitude began to, or at least it, it was being manifested openly in society that was more toward. Um, somatocentrism and celebration of body uh, or a more balanced, uh, if, if not a more extreme, as I will mention, uh, like the, this uh, obsession with the nose or with body image, Botox, uh, cosmetics, and so forth. Um, uh, so, in, and I, I will uh, mention here, uh, some of the reasons behind this change. Uh, and I look at it, these reasons uh, from a global perspective, which I have uh, been keen on uh, in the past uh, couple of decades of my studies. That is, I emphasize the increasing nature of globalized world and the interplay of both local and the global changes that affect any society, especially Iranians as, and the younger ones who have become so well connected 
to the global trends, the global discourse of feminism, the global discourse of human rights, uh, by their access to the internet, to the social media, and so forth. So I believe that many aspects of changes in marriage, family, gender roles, sexuality, and sexual mores, changes in the functions and structure of the family, gradual decline in the patriarchal family, trends toward marriage based on individual choices, love, and compatibility, rather than family arrangements, the gradually growing egalitarian trend in the family relationship with a child-centered approach rather than father-centered or patriarchal. Um, and the, as if the, the family is, or the main purpose of the family is uh, taking care of the child, not necessarily the old idea of the, the purpose of sex and marriage is procreation, but just the value is not attached to the children, to humanity, especially children's rights. That was uh, not, um, you know, a widespread in say four or five decades ago. So, and also changes in forms of marriages and sexual unions, uh, gradual trends towards recognition and acceptance of diversity within sexuality and the rights of sexual minority more acceptance toward divorce and singlehood. Uh, so many of these aspects that different papers have been discussing uh, are actually um, in accord with the, uh, certain global trends that not, is not unique to Iran. Even um, growing um, number of women in higher education. So rather than looking at a causal relationship between Islamism, either uh, negative or positive, I think more important and inevitable influences coming from the global uh, context are uh, shaping these changes and especially of course, in the context of local changes like growing urbanization and education and, and demographic changes. So I would uh, say that uh, the, uh, despite resistance of especially the law and uh, very discriminatory laws in favor of men, as uh, Ms. Uh, Mehrangi's car explained, uh, despite all that, uh, there, is, uh, there are these changes happening under the skin of the cities. And, um, and sometimes not really under it, they are very visible and uh, observable. And at times, at least some factions of the ruling Islamists have accepted these changes or have submitted to these changes and have sometimes even kind of um, try to echo the voices of uh, opposition to the uh, laws and so forth. But, the, but the, the deep state, the hardline clerics and the rigid laws have, uh, have resisted uh, these changes. Therefore, there has been a, a discrepancy and wide gap between the law between the state policies for the most part and between what is happening on the ground in the larger society. Uh, that's why uh, researchers in Iran and outside Iran, uh, such as Shahla Ezazi, speak of the crisis resulted in due to the, this wide gap and tension that is continuously going on between uh, the changes, real realities of these changes and uh, the barriers, legal barriers and policy barriers. Uh, for example, uh, the legal marriage age is for girls is 13 and even uh, practically they can go as low as nine uh, based on Sharia, while the real average of marriage age uh, is 22, 25 for women. And um, 
if for men, the minimum age of marriage uh, is in the law 15, in reality, men don't marry on, before like age 25, 27. So uh, many scholars have talked about this and um, Janet just mentioned some of these uh, discrepancies and uh, tensions. Demographic changes uh, are very important uh, that have brought about a lot of sociocultural changes. As uh, scholars like Saeed Pevandi have uh, uh, discussed, for example, the eighth national census data of 2016 reveals that there have been continuous trends in the past three decades toward structural shifts <clears throat> in demographic behaviors of Iranian population. <coughs> the average annual growth in population has decreased from 3.7% to 1.3%. And this, of course, has meaningful uh, <clears throat> and significant sociological implications <clears throat> and, are, uh, and are reflective of uh, changes in gender roles and sexuality related <clears throat> patterns, um, declining fertility rates from six children per woman to 1.8, uh, comparing 1975 Iranian uh, you know, rates to uh, 2016, <clears throat> or even the family members uh, show that 54% uh, that of the population in Iran had five members and in 2016, it's only 17%, meaning over half of Iranian families are only two or three people. And that's a big change. Uh, so <clears throat> since Janet mentioned many of these uh, facts and figures, I'm gonna uh, skip them and just uh, highlight the point that today in Iran, there are over 10 million people, 6 million men and 4 million women uh, of age 20 to 40 who are single. And this is unprecedented in Iranian history because marriage is such an important institution and is a requirement. So <clears throat> it is natural that this 10 uh, million people are looking for other forms of union, sexual union, and other forms of family building. And so these 10 millions are either divorcees or people who have never married. Uh, so I don't talk, I don't need to uh, repeat a, you know, the, the facts and figures about changes in uh, forms of uh, sexual unions, in forms of marriage. Uh, Janet, in both of her talks, has uh, extensively talked about it. But let me just mention that one of the um, research uh, reports uh, carried out inside Iran talks about the Senkhshenasi or typology of this new non-standard uh, sexual relationship uh, outside of the standard marriage. And uh, these the six, six types, uh, they called it a group of uh, researchers, Ravo Bete Azad, free uh, relationship, um, rather similar to uh, prostitution because it's like tr sexual transactions. Uh, the second one, of course, uh, based on traditional sire or the new changes that people have made on uh, sire, made it a long, longer term sire, and don't even call it sire. Uh, like having girlfriend, boyfriend, rabobete duste, dochter duste, pesar, uh, the uh, cohabitation, called in different names, uh, of course, and or or uh, relationships that are <clears throat> uh, usually based on um, like um, not cheating. What's the word? How like um, 
giving like promising for a long-term relationship by men while taking advantage sexual advantage of the younger women and then leaving them and abandoning them and the sixth one uh, is uh, the rabobit mobtani bar ishq sayyal, meaning like very fluid uh, um, love uh, relationship, and uh, depending on how long that love lasts, uh, the, the relationship is can continue or stop. So, and they are also finding that uh, about twenty five percent of students, uh, women students in Tehran at least. Uh, have experienced sexual relationship with uh, the opposite, with the, with the heterosexual relationship uh, of different forms in uh, before marriage, before standard marriage. If you compare this kind of, uh, at least this six type of uh, sexual unions or relationship uh, with what uh, like sociologists are finding in a country like Sweden, they are talking about 17 forms of marital or non-marital uh, sexual partnerships, which shows that we are just, again, moving toward this diversification of family structures and <clears throat> uh, sexual unions as it's happening in different societies. And these are either done, these uh, kind of, uh, you know, many of them, rather underground or not quite openly, but some more openly, uh, are either done in a kind of a, uh, the kind of a quiet and uh, covered uh, ways. And uh, for those who are searching for self uh, freedom and autonomy, so, or the ones who, which are conscious deliberate choice in pursuing individual freedom and autonomy and challenging the status quo, challenging the law. Uh, so, like passive, quiet, uh, based on personal choices, not necessarily an act of, act of defiance, but more active. As Mehdi Turaj, Tur uh, if I pronounce his last name correctly, in his paper talks about conformist model of agency versus emancipatory model of agency, which we, we see in uh, the application of those concepts in these different type of uh, marriages and different group of women. The, <clears throat> so there are other uh, manifestations of these changes from uh, somato uh, phobic uh, culture to somatocentric culture. For example, Me Too campaign and Me Too movement that has now uh, also reached Iran um, actually is trying to shift from the victim blaming, that is blaming women <laughs> usually, to the culprit blaming and already is achieving some success in changing the discourse and attitude of larger society, even some government's actions we have seen in arresting some of these perpetrators of sexual abuses of women and sexual assaults and so forth. Um, so the women in this campaign actually are trying to reclaim their body and sexuality rather than feeling shy and guilty about it. They are speaking out assertively and uh, blaming the the culprit rather than themselves for these abuses. Another in interesting point is that the clerical policy of trying to normalize or legitimize temporary marriage or sire, especially during their Friday prayers, as mentioned by Nassim uh, Basiri in her paper, has ironically and indirectly facilitated non-traditional sexual unions, such as white marriage. And this has happened among the, even the younger Iranians. So while the intention of Sira originally, in traditional meaning of it, was to serve, uh, not to serve the youth and unmarried people, but to be an extra um, mechanism or venue for older men or middle-aged men and married men to seek sexual pleasure 
outside the regular marriage, especially during travels and so forth. But of course, except for the famous uh, declaration of Ayatollah Rafsanjani in one of his Friday prayers, who directly promoted Siga to be used among the youth who cannot afford to get married and establish new family and uh, financially uh, because of financial hardship. So uh, he just directly suggested go for Siga. But usually this was not meant for the young people and unmarried people. Uh, or as Zehtab, Maryam Zehtab in her paper on girls for sale pointed out, certain terminologies used by feminists are entering into the mainstream discourse of the media and state organs, such as child marriage rather than early marriage, and kudak hamsari, and uh, attempts on the part, which, you know, try, on the part of feminists, the attempt is to, um, to highlight the rights of children and, uh, and uh, associate uh, child marriage uh, with uh, sexual violence and slavery, and rightly so. And uh, so this is affecting another you know, changes in even general public's attitude to child marriage. Another manifestation that, uh, of change is the uh, beauty business in Iran. Um, not only uh, rhinoplasty, that is no surgery, but um, also uh, Botox, lips uh, of lips, on, uh, um, or sculpture, cheekbones uh, are afford also affordable in Iran. And, and also a hymenoplasty or restoration of uh, virginity that uh, Janet mentioned rather uh, extensively. So the plastic surgery growing into a big industry and business in Iran itself is big manifestation of this emphasis on, soma on body, on uh, kind of a trend towards somatocentrism. And, um, or other examples include uh, the, the fact that Valentine Day has become a big <laughs> deal in Iran, big uh, celebration and big business too, of course. Or dance and music in public on the streets, which is a kind of a counterculture, cultural defiance against repression against music and dancing and uh, singing, especially among women. And this is very daring uh, um, celebration of body, of love, of uh, joy, of pleasure, uh, in contrast to ascetic, uh, you know, spirituality or emphasis on uh, mind and spirit rather than body. So uh, significance of sports uh, among women and how much despite all these restrictions against women, how women are actively engaging in sports and trying to even, uh, you know, uh, shine internationally. So it looks like a, a sort of flapper's uh, style of life uh, is seen in Iran, uh, especially among the youngest generation of boys and girls. And this, the type of their activism, uh, especially with regard to compulsory hijab and so forth, the way they appear in public, they, the way they use cosmetics, the way they dress, all these are, uh, if you remember the flappers uh, of 1920s in America happened also, uh, of course it, it, was a, it wasn't a long lasting uh, um, phenomenon, uh, because of the Great Depression, it, it almost stopped and of course was revived in, in 1960s during the sexual revolution. But, in, but it, that uh, process of the flappers uh, using very, you know, like uh, high uh, light headed dancing, smoking in public, wearing uh, sh uh, very uh, exposing uh, clothing and comfortable clothing and using lots of cosmetics and so forth and showing sexual freedom and celebration of sexuality and so forth was 
you can see that kind of um, counterculture now growing among the youth, especially. So, uh, yes, you, how much time I have, or am I? We are a lot over time. <laughs> really? Oh my God. Okay. okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about a, speci a specific book that has studied the changes in the type of love and the love patterns, but I leave it to the question and answer uh, section, hopefully, because I don't want to go over time more than this. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was um, fascinating what you were telling us. That's why, you know, I kept silent. <laughs> I want <laughs> Sorry. I didn't watch my watch. I want to hear more. Um, but um, we do, can, can we have Mehrangis and Janet John back? Okay, thank you so much for all the presentations. This was um, fabulous and a great wrap up of the um, symposium. Um, we have a few questions, and the first one is um, from Dr. Padhami for everyone. Um, you can all chime in. Isn't the pursuit of laws protecting women a losing battle in Iran? Even existing laws aren't honored by Islamic judges and defense lawyers when allowed in particular court cases and imprisoned for insisting the laws to be followed. So what does another law on the books buy us? And any of the speakers can address the question. Well, I think, I mean, I'm sure Mehangis Kar can answer it very well, but you know, you can, you can make changes in society, but as long until you have laws you can actually stabilize it you know so this is i think it's very important that we see all these changes taking place in iranian society but it doesn't replace the effort to ultimately change the laws as well mm -hmm. yeah in actually in the parts of con the conclusion part of my paper i talk about this the dilemma of these changes because uh women are still in many type of these uh, sexual unions are in disadvantaged and vulnerable position. They have little or no protection. And children too, especially the children of such you know, sexual uh, unions, they don't have a legal, legal protection. They don't have, they are more vulnerable. So on the one hand, women are feeling more confident about themselves they are more, more they show more agency they they don't they transgress the laws and enter into relationship based on their own choices these are all wonderful but at the same time they are many of them as uh, the data by uh, janet showed and this is not just in iran that majority of women don't are either questioning these uh, non-standard marriages or asking for illegalizations of them. Uh, in Iran, the same findings, uh, the, the research done in universities, interviews uh, show the same, at least ambivalent, ambivalence, if not negative, because we, it's like a dilemma, if you don't do it, the choice of traditional marriage is not more promising the same problem with regard to divorce and uh, child custody and other uh, laws. But, um, but it, it's a question that I left at the end of my conclusion, what to do, what next, especially for feminists. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, there is a question for Dr. Carr. Is stoning being practiced in Iran and whether or not it is Shia or Sunni law? Yeah, it is not in Quran. Uh, and it is something, um, you know, some punishment that is very, very old uh, 
and now uh, they they accept it on the legal system of Iran and uh, uh, many of clerics who we call them moderate uh, moderate mullahs moderate clerics they say that uh, it is not necessary uh, to be as Sharia law uh, in the legal system. Uh, so uh, I think uh, they can, they can stop it, but they don't do that. They can say that uh, for one year, for two years, for three years, uh, it is a stop, but they didn't do that. And I, I can say that we had many uh, stoning uh, since uh, victory of Islamic uh, uh, revolution since 1979. And after that, uh, in a period of time, uh, European, European governments, uh, they had pressure on Iran for uh, changing something in Estonia, but they didn't do that. Just uh, they promised orally that we will stop it, but we cannot change the legal system because it is the Sharia. And so uh, for a few years, it was stopped. And then after, uh, after energy has the nuclear uh, problem, that it was, you know, uh, an issue between uh, Iran and Europe and the United States. They uh, started again stoning. It was, you know, it was becoming some uh, political issue uh, for the government of Iran. Uh, but now I can understand that it is stopping, but not changing the legal system. It is on the Islamic penal code, but they don't do that. And that's good because we don't have any more chance now. Just our chance is uh, coming if we can have good regime change and peaceful regime change. Thank you. Um, we have a question, rather a comment for Dr. Afari from uh, Facebook, if you want to comment on it as well. Um, they are saying hymenoplasty is not necessarily a, a form of resistance. It can be looked upon as another form of acquiescence to the patriarchy in place. Right. And that is, in fact, the debate. There are two, two sort of schools of thought on this question. Um, some people say, but I think um, as long as men don't change, I mean, this is really about the men. I mean, why are these men... Um, dating women of their own social class. You know, this is a big change because in the Pahlavi era, in the early Pahlavi era, a lot of men, when they wanted to have a sex, sexual relationship, they would go with sex workers. They didn't have the option of meeting women of their own social class and not becoming sexually intimate. So that's changed. People are, men are actually going with women of their own social class. But the mindset, mm, some of the issues that Naira talked about, the mindset about the body and uh, thinking of the body that has been sexually exposed as perhaps defiled, uh, that is a very strong one. And as long as men don't change, women ought to have some, re this is sort of my position, that women ought to have, and I think the author also, Azala Hadi, who unfortunately is no longer with us, she died tragically, is that um, this is a one recourse for women as long as the men have not changed. Otherwise, what are you saying? You're saying that either women should never have sex before marriage or, or that they should be punished for having sex before marriage because there is no other option. Thank you. Um, we have a question for everyone from Dr. Hegland. Thank you for these wonderful papers. Except for Dr. Carr's paper, you presented some uh, positive trends. Does this mean that you feel there is some hope for some positive changes for females, women and girls in Iran? Will the cultural and social changes that women have brought about perhaps, perhaps all, um, also bring about some political and legal changes? 
uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, uh, our speeches uh, a little were confusing uh, for audience because I was talking about legal system and legal system is, that is what it is. And we cannot uh, deny that. We cannot deny the article. We cannot deny the note on the article. And if somebody just read this um, legal system, uh, like me at the beginning of a revolution because I was going to practice in Islamic uh, courts, uh, I couldn't sleep for a long time at night. And everything was, you know, like, uh, I don't know, some, something in my mind. And uh, um, really, I couldn't, uh, I was so scared, so scared. And I didn't know um, uh, if uh, people, they do get knowledge about this legal system, uh, they will lose uh, their healthy, their psychological health. And that's why uh, I can say that we cannot deny a very bad and very bloody uh, legal system of Iran, not just for women, for everybody, for non-Muslim, uh, for um, sometimes uh, for Muslim and for Shia who is criticizing the system and the policy makers uh, and Khomeini and Valiye Fari. So this legal system is a bloody legal system. I cannot give any positive, any positive value to this legal system because I practiced as lawyer 22 years in Islamic Republic of Iran and all courts I was going. And uh, just when I was arrested, I could understand more than uh, when I was in practice. And I could understand that something that is positive on the legal system of Iran, they don't care about that in the jail and in the Islamic courts, in the revolutionary courts. So uh, I respect uh, uh, some positive uh, some positive perspective that the Professor Tohidi and Professor Afari uh, they gave to audience here. I am so happy uh, that uh, some kind of change in Iran happened that I'm not sure. And I, I don't know uh, this uh, Omar, this um, these things that the academic people, they talk about that, how much could be in practice beneficial for women? Just, I believe one of that. That's true. Iranian women, when understood that the Islamic revolution and the revolution is against their rights as human beings, they step by step get power and they became powerful to challenge with hijab ejbari with uh, mandate hijab the first the first step was that and it is still like that and for everything that now we are talking as positive things or change in Iran, everything is coming from women and female and not from government. And if you can uh, read Muzakirat Majlis, I mean negotiations in parliament, you can understand that there is no, no opinion on equality between men and women, Muslim and non-Muslim, uh, faithful with this uh, government and uh, dissident people and everything. So uh, 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 I became very happy uh, by these speeches, but I couldn't 
practiced 20 years ago that I left Iran. Probably now it is like that. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask, yes, Dr. Saidi and Dr. Alfari to comment on this. Yes, I, I, I think it was hopefully clear and not misunderstood that we were talking about the society, changes within the larger society. We were not talking about changes in the government. Uh, so the, these positive changes are happening despite those uh, repressive and discriminatory laws. And that is the whole uh, irony of it. And we were, I think both Janet and me were saying that how other uh, forceful factors, by forceful I mean changes that are inevitable historically, that are happening, like urbanization, like education of women, and uh, that have empowered women that have changed the traditional views and the global factor, glo the impact of global feminism, human rights discourse and so forth. These are the things we were talking about. So much so that just recently in a, on a TV, a state-run TV uh, discussion, even an official uh, person, a former chief editor of Kehan, was saying that the statistics show that 70% of people in Iran are against compulsory veiling. And this is coming from the mouth. I mean, that's an admission which shows the influence of women's movement, shows the impact, the positive impact of women's activism and agency. Not changes in the law yet, not changes in the mentality of the deepest state. Uh, there are some who are more, you know, flexible to with making uh, maybe hijab less compulsory or less harsh treatment against uh, women who don't observe uh, Sharia based hijab. But, but all we are saying is that how society is changing and have changed. And that's why there is a crisis. There is a wide gap between the government, between the state and people. More, more so today, uh, the majority have been kind of staying away and the, the government has lost a lot of support. It, it, it's running just by, by, by a minority. That's why they are resorting to force and you know, brutal repression because they don't have the support of the majority of people. I think this question of discrepancy between law of land and the social attitudes is not just limited to Iran. And certainly you can even find it in democratic United States. I mean, we're in the midst of a Black Lives Matter movement. It's a movement that is fighting for the rights of African Americans who are disproportionately harassed uh, by the police. And yet the laws on the books have not changed. I mean, you still have situations where the police uh, indiscriminately do uh, and disproportionately do uh, harm and, and harass uh, African-Americans. So even in this country, after like how many year, months have we had at Black Lives Matter? Six months, not really much has happened changed. But what's happened is that the mindset is changing, right? So we actually have a lot of white people coming in demonstrations, and that is a very good thing. So all the commentators, are, and, and I think we're talking about something similar in Iran. We're not talking about this government changing on its own. We're talking about the mindset of the Iranian people. And the more important thing, not just the women who are changing, but I think now the men have to really change. Once that happens, once you have a vast majority of people start thinking differently about these sort of things, then when an opportunity comes up, and who knows when that opportunity is, the death of the supreme leader, some other cat catastrophe, then there's a possibility maybe of some change. But without that change in thinking of people at the grassroots level, you could have many revolutions and nothing will ever happen, you know, because the mindset of the people hasn't changed. Can I give a comment, just a comment? Yes, please. 
<laughs> Just I want to add to Professor uh, Afari that that's true. But something that can uh, help us, help uh, any nation uh, to change something in legal system that is uh, uh, violate human rights is freedom of speech. And in and if in a country there is no freedom of speech, we cannot be hopeful for having change in legal system, like homosexuality, uh, like something that now uh, uh, she was talking about that, everything for change, for changing legal system is coming from freedom of speech. And this is the only uh, and very bad and the mother of our problems in Iran is the lack of freedom of speech. So we cannot compare these two countries with each other if we don't say about the lack of freedom of speech in Iran. Well, that's freedom of expression and demonstration. That's of course a given. We have another problem in Iran, which for example, the Sunni countries don't have. So you have something similar to white marriage going on in Tunisia, for example, or you have it also in Egypt, actually, Urfi marriages are becoming quite prevalent. Over there, the state doesn't, you, a woman doesn't have to worry if she goes to the state and complains that this man was in an Urfi marriage with me, I have a child. And if she proved the paternity, which is expensive, and she has to you know, do a DNA test and all that, the state now goes after the man and gets paternity um, uh, funding, basically has him support the child. You know, It's still the burden is on the woman. You can't do that in Iran because in Iran, the woman has, not, has gone against religious law as, as well as you know, state law, as well as conventional wisdom. And so I think the situation of Iranian women is far more complicated for that reason. As I could understand. That's true. They are religious and they believe it. Them at the courts, family courts in Iran, that when the judge, Islamic judge, was saying them, that okay, the custody is not your right in, in this age or something like that, and the divorce is not uh, your right in this situation or something like that. She was crying and she was saying, no, this is not Islam. And the Islamic judge was saying that this is Islam and they were mentioned Quran. And I was witnessing many times that these women, they were shouting, they were crying, and they were saying that we didn't know that is Islam. And sometimes there was chaos. So practice is very, very different with theory and with something that you, you can see on the street of Iran. And, but you are right, and this is true, just it's conditional, not we cannot say for public, we cannot say for all women in Iran that they are, because they are religious, they are faithful with ruler and this legal system of Iran right now. We cannot say that. Culturally, yes. Sometimes it is not some strange thing that their brother or their husband or their son, they ask them something. But it is very different when they go to the court, Islamic court, and they could understand that the Islamic court is against them. Thank you. Um, we are half an hour over our time. I don't want <laughs> our presenters very long here. Dr. Tohidi, if you could quickly name the um, book you mentioned the, or share information about that book. Okay, let me go back to my notes. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is based on <clears throat> a new book that came out in 2018 called, <clears throat> excuse me, Sociology of Love, Evolution of Feminine Narrative of Love in Iran. Jamea Shenasi Eshq, Tahavul Dar گفتار زنانه عشق یا روایت, روایت زنانه عشق در ایران <تصفيق> با سهیلا علی رزا نجاد which was reviewed by نوشین احمدی خراسانی <تصفيق> in the same issue of the journal of آزادی اندیشه that Claudia, you and Janet both of you have articles in the seventh uh, issue of that journal. So you can read the book review. Uh, it's an in-depth interview with 46 educated women in Tehran, age range of 24 to 70, during 12 years of their life. So it was a kind of a long uh, process of looking at the changes even within these uh, women's lives. Uh, although you can not generalize it to all women. It's just in Tehran and also among educated women. But she finds that eight types of changes have happened uh, with regard to the way people, I mean women here, the, at least these women, perceive love uh, and understand the meaning of love. One is seeing love from, an, from a dangerous element to a necessity for life and marriage. Love was something to be afraid of. Uh, you know, don't be careful not to fall in love. That was the attitude. Uh, the second change is in expectations about uh, any sexual union, uh, such as respect, understanding, sharing intimate thoughts and feelings, respect for private boundaries of each partner, and respect for their desires, kind of a mutual respect and intimacy. The third change is for younger girls, uh, love is more, at least this is what they are saying, for younger girls, love is more about bodily pleasure and sex. That is, they are more somatocentric. While for many generation uh, in the past or even today, it is more about relationship and companionship. Uh, the fourth change is reduction in the length or duration and also depth of love. Love has become short-lived uh, in many relationships, they are saying. The fifth is less stress on loyalty, on commitment, and more attention to seeking pleasure and variety in sexual uh, relationships. And the sixth one is increasing role of the internet and social media in building and breaking relationships. Many of the relationships are being broken in the, on the internet in, uh, or being built uh, through the internet. Seven, I'm sorry, I'm just giving quickly, uh, so running fast. Um, the seventh change is more tendency toward multiple experiences of relationships in life rather than staying with one partner and remaining loyal uh, to, to that partner. The eighth and last one is loving in masculine style uh, among women. It's a new tendency emerge, emerging among the new generation of women who are trying to a copy men's style of loving. And so they are like, they are trying to be less committed and less uh, devoted to their, and, they, and seech, seeking more uh, multiple relationship and so forth. Uh, so another book that came, uh, came out, which talks about uh, similar uh, changes, is called On Madaran in Dukhtaran. Uh, those mothers, these daughters, again in 2018, which shows that how the values uh, and priorities among the younger generations have changed, like the selfless mothers, mothers who uh, like uh, put their lives in line for their children uh, is, is not uh, 
necessarily a virtue among this younger generations and there's a decline in and more uh, and more emphasis on a self-centered um, you know and uh, more emphasis on uh, seeking pleasure and um, so in the work of Master Rada Amir Ibrahimi or Erika Friedel and Mary Hegland, you see that even in the rural areas, there are similar patterns of change uh, with regard to the attitudes and sexu towards sexuality and sexual morals. So in conclusion, I tried to talk about the vulnerabilities and problems and risks involved for women, especially younger girls in these non-standard uh, sexual uh, relationships and, um, and asked us what to do, how to, you know, how to take care of these vulnerabilities for the children uh, from these type of uh, relationships and for women who say still to be less protected and more vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Um, so we have a lot of questions here. I apologize to all of you if your question has not been addressed. I would like to add, um, wrap up and end it with one comment from Dr. Rezvani, who says, I don't have a question, but I would like to thank you and your great speakers for organizing this great symposium. I enjoyed and learned a lot. I'm proud of this new generation of Iranian women in Iran. They are so great, thank you. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers today, our speakers um, all across every panel, um, and all the presenters and the papers and all of the participants who've been with us for this entire month every Saturday. Um, don't forget, we have a panel on Afro-Iranians this coming Tuesday at 3 p.m. Um, Eastern, and we would love to see you there as well. Thanks so much for your participation and very engaging questions. Without you, this would not um, have been possible. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>